All right, I see we're recording. Um, welcome everybody to the planning board meeting of December 13th, 2022. It is seven o'clock and we will kick off with our first bit of business, which is <laughs> actually to continue that bit of business. Um, so this is for 48Y Fitchburg Turnpike, parcel 3419. Um, the, They've asked to continue this to January 24th, 2023. So a little ways from now. Um, and we do need a motion for that. Would some, would anybody like to make a motion for that? Also no. need to, oh, yeah, um, accept, yeah. And also need to accept the time extension. Yes. You yes. want me to bring that up? Uh, Linda, do it. you want, Okay. Linda has it. Linda's yeah, okay. willing yeah. to do it. I have, I have it right in front of me. Go ahead, Linda. Um, I move that we continue the public hearing on the definitive subdivision application without discussion to January 24, 2023 at 7 p.m. Um, for um, it for a North Road LLC to create a one lot subdivision with access from the town of Sudbury for the conquered portion of the tract at 48Y Fitchburg Turnpike parcel 3419 and accept a grant of a time extension to January 27, 2023 for the planning board to, to file its decision with the town clerk. Second. Thank you, Mark. All right, uh, we'll take a vote as, as the people I see. So Mark? Yes. Linda? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Sue? Yes. And I'm also a yes. And in doing that vote, I realized I didn't <laughs> I didn't take a, uh, a check-in of board members before starting that off. So we'll do that really quickly just as a formality. So um, those that are here, so it's kind of doing this again. <laughs> Mark? Here. here. Linda? Here. Andrew? Here. Sue? Here. Uh, Nate, this is Nathan. I am here, and uh, we know that Haley will not be joining us this evening. Uh, sorry for, for forgetting that, guys. Okay. On to the administrative items. Uh, the first one will be um, uh, the Historic District. Uh, the Historic District Commission um, has <coughs> a planning board designee. Uh, I think. Uh, do we have we have somebody here who's going to do the nope. introduction? Yes. <laughs> Good. All right, I will hand it off then for that. Oh, you're muted now. Go ahead. Now I'm unmuted, I hope. There you go. Okay, very good. I'm uh, a bit of a Luddite when it comes to computer things. <laughs> uh, I'm Walter Clay. I'm here as a candidate. So what would you like to know? What makes you qualified to sit on the HDC? Um, I had spoken to uh, Dennis Fiore initially um, at some length. Uh, I've spoken to Henry Moss as well. Uh, I have not, my green card application uh, pointed out that I have not worked professionally in the trade, okay. uh, but I have uh, certainly a working knowledge. I've uh, been involved in renovating several historic houses. Uh, I moved to Concord from Newburyport, where I was uh, extremely involved in uh, the effort to try to get an historic district. Great, of thank five you. years of experience there. Yeah, thanks. It's a great commission, you should enjoy it. So. I hope so. That's it, that's all I got. Anybody else have any questions? Need a motion? Do you need a motion, Nathan? We, we, we would need a motion if there are no, <laughs> there are oh. no other questions. <laughs> I can make up answers. If you <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I guess I make a, I had it open a second ago. Uh, I make a motion 
uh, that we recommend, recommend uh, Mr. Clay to the Historic District Commission. Um, is, there, is there a term on here for a position that will be vacant as of January 1st, 2023? Second. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let's vote through. Uh, Mark, you're the first one I see, so back to you. Yes. Linda. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Sue. Yes. I'm also a yes. So that was that was quick and easy. I look forward to uh, hearing more about you know your your activity on the HTC. Well, I look forward to it. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for your contribution, Walter. Yes. Thank you for your time in there. Well, thank you for the consideration and the approval. All right, and then we have a West Concord Advisory Committee member appointment uh, recommendation. Uh, Ms. Hammond. Oh, going as Pilates. <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. I don't, train, I don't know. So I'm Nicole Hammond. I've lived in West Concord almost 20 years between the Thoreau School and Cousins Field in our lovely little village. And it has always been a dream of mine since I was a child to live in a village. And I feel extraordinarily lucky to live in West Concord. Is there, are there any questions? They for, just- for, uh, for us, I guess we, we know- some I don't of the have questions for that. you. I didn't know if I was gonna be voted upon. They just said that I might wanna drop in on this meeting and introduce myself. I used to do development and I think one of the keys to the development that I did for medical research and outreach programming was education. And that's one, like my love of the community as well as making sure that the people know what is going on and get involvement within it um, really piques my interest. Well, that sort of answers the question I was gonna ask what your, your, sort of your primary focus and interest would be within uh, um, the well, West Concord Advisory? Well, it would be education, but it would also be looking at uh, my background with sociology prior to development. And I love studying the, um, the study of aggregates, which is groups and populations. And we have a variety of populations from what I have seen in the last 20 years here between Minuteman, the three preschools or daycare centers, as well as um, the uh, nursing home, um, people that work at the prison, there are also the office parks. And then even within this community, one reason why I like it so much is that we know our neighbors. We, I play with a eight-year-old and I walk a 103-year-old home sometimes. So I love the diversity of ages. Um, it seems to be getting more um, diverse in backgrounds than when I first moved here in some ways. I'm hearing more languages being spoken. I am concerned about the rail trail and the train. I know about what has been going on a little bit with the train deaths and the, um, and the crosswalks and whatnot there. So I have a interest in safety, I guess, is what you would also say, having been a lifeguard for many years to put myself through college. Um, and I raised my kids here who are now full adults on their own, but they love nothing more than a Walden pizza and they have to go to tea cakes and get a tea cakes cookie for every uh, Christmas stocking or Easter basket. Um, it was interesting. I was in the post office today mailing a card to my mother and I heard people talking about why the five and 10 closed. And they were coming up with various ideas. And I, I was like, should I step in or not? And I just walked over and I was like, oh, it's because Maynard retired. And like, oh, he retired. And I said, yeah, that's because Chris, his stepson, passed away, unfortunately, a while ago. And he was the one that was supposed to take over the five and 10. I still remember the Mandrioli. So I like the idea of having a little bit of the institutional background, nothing like some of my neighbors who have been in, been here for 98 years, believe me. 
But for my 20 years, the institutional background, as well as moving forward into what its current needs are introduced, uh, really interests me. Great. Are there any questions from board members to? Yeah. I wanted to comment, you sound like an excellent and very dedicated candidate for the West Concord Advisory Committee. If I recall correctly, you have not had a chance yet to meet with them because your green card came in too recently? Correct. So I read about it on Nextdoor last week. Mm. And I've been asked to be on a variety of committees. And I choose them carefully because I want them, I want it to be because if it's something that I'm Deep, I deeply, deeply care about and have meaning to me. And so I sent in my information last week and lo and behold, I'm here <laughs> talking to you guys. <laughs> oh, wonderful. It sounds, you sound like a great candidate to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for volunteering. Oh, I look forward to it. Mark, Linda, or Andrew? No questions. Nope. All right. With that, would somebody somebody like to make a motion? <laughs> I'm in the embarrassed position of having forgotten your name, Pilates. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Pilates. Yeah. I have Nicole Hammond. Nicole Hammond. I move to recommend Nicole Hammond. Wait, do we get to appoint her ourselves or do we have to recommend it to the Board of Selectmen? Uh, you make a recommendation to the select board. That's what I thought. Um, I move to recommend Nicole Hammond to the select board for appointment to the West Concord Advisory Committee. And I'll second. Thank you. All right, Mark? Yes. Linda? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Sue? Yes. And I'm also yes. Thank you very much. And I just put on my to-do list to change my Zoom name from Pilates. <laughs> You're very welcome. I, I'm just going to say you have, of the, all the people we've have on here at any given time, you have one of the nicest background of, of arranged oh, things. It's very neat. <laughs> Well, my kids are coming home soon, and I like to decorate. They expect certain decorations, and I live in a house that is part of the historic area of West Concord. Um, this house was 1905, that uh, Bloomfield Apperson family, if any of you guys remember that wonderful family. They were here for many, many decades. Um, they live in the house, but thank you. By the way, I have my kitchen door closed. That's okay. A little messy <laughs> in there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, very thank much. you for, for you know taking the time and uh, enjoy the holidays. You too. Bye, guys. Bye bye. All right, and then we are on to our third administrative thing, which is the housing production plan. Uh, plan adoption. So, uh, in a previous meeting, Marsha <clears throat> walked through the. Uh, housing production plan. Um, and so during this meeting, basically if there's any sort of last minute questions or anything from board members uh, uh, that Marsha is able to answer or Elizabeth, um, this is the time for that. And then we can take it, take a minute to uh, uh, to vote on our, our support of it, right? That's what, yes. Uh, so. Approval of it, actually. Approval, yes. Do you want a sort of a synopsis of the comments heard and, and what was done to this latest the edit? The sure. editing? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say we we received multiple um multiple comments from multiple sources, which included our public forum and follow-up from the public, um, the planning board, select board, League of Women Voters, the DEI Commission, and the steering committee. Um, for the housing production plan, as well as the various housing groups that were involved. And we had three layers of editors, editors going. Um, J.M. Golson Associates did the first round of edits. Then Liz Rust, our regional housing services office uh, director, did the second set. And then I did the final edits to incorporate um, and, and streamline and make sure things hung together. So um, I hope 
Um, I know that there's going to be here and there some glitches or some things that don't quite hang together, but um, all in all, we've we've had a, a very robust editorial um, group looking at this and looking over everything. So some of the highlights of the changes, um, we added the need for family housing and for group homes for people with disabilities um, to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion in the community. Uh, we identified a couple of new ways to preserve existing smaller homes. We added Concord Center as a location for MBTA community zoning um, with a because a portion is within a half mile of the um, Thorough Street Depot. And we listed two potential sites for 40B in Concord Center. We removed the two, for, two farms that had been identified as potential 40B locations from the list. Um, there was a, a large contingent that were concerned about that. Um, we revised the language about the reformatory branch trail, um, some of the details of that, and updated the information regarding the MBTA Communities Act uh, to reflect the recent changes adopted by the state just this week. Uh, or just last week, and then um, added the list at the very, very end of creative thinking ideas from the League of Women Voters, because um, we didn't incorporate all of their creative thinking ideas because there had been no forum to vet them. Um, their, their comments came in on um, late in the day on November 30th, so we were trying to get as much as we could done. Um, before we met with the select board on December 5th, and then we took the, their, the select board's comments and last minute comments to edit this past week. So, or just at the end of last week, we got everything done by Friday and distributed and posted so that you would have a chance to review it. Um, so those are the sort of the highlights that I am aware of. Um, if there are any specific questions, I will try to answer them. And I know that there are representatives here from the um, Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust and the steering committee uh, who can fill in if I don't have the answers at hand. Thank you for that, Marcia. <clears throat> Are there any questions from uh, other board members? I, I feel like we did talk about 90% of this uh, during the, the prior meeting quite extensively. So I, I just have a, a Quick comment and a quick question. Uh, first of all, it's an impressive document, Marcia. The people involved in it should be complimented on that. It's very comprehensive. Okay, so, um, and this has been vetted by all of the agencies and commissions within the town that are party to this. Uh, you know, all, we have a bunch of different housing uh, groups, and they've all given it their blessing. We've had representatives from all of the housing groups um, on the steering committee, and yep. both the community, the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and the steering committee have recommended approval to the select board. Okay, I mean, because it's obviously their purview. You know, they, I'm sure, spend a lot of time on this far more than I do. So, okay, thank you. Are there any other board members with any questions? Okay, then I guess we can move forward with uh, making a vote for approval. Uh, there's a, this, <laughs> this uh, opportunity was only for uh, board members to discuss. We had an open forum on this. Uh, I think it was the last meeting and I know there's been several meetings um, on this topic uh, with other, uh, other committees and also that the housing production plan itself had its own. Uh, meeting. So there's been opportunity for a lot of public input. Uh, and I know that Marsha and others, as she stated, have really taken every opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, take that input and have it form uh, the housing production plan that we have here today. So with that in mind, uh, we'll move forward with a vote. Um, and uh, can I... Do I have it in front of me or does somebody else have it? I just closed that. I have it. Do you want Thank me to you, Mark. Yes, please go. Yep. So I make a motion that we adopt, vote to adopt the housing production plan as outlined in the um, memo that has been put forth. What else do you need? I I think that's, <laughs> I think that okay. is all we need. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so if we can get us, I'll, I'll second that. Um, and then for voting, we'll start again. Mark? Yes. Linda? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Sue? Yes. And I am also yes. Is Marsha frozen? <laughs> it looks that way. Yeah. Well, I was going to say thank you to her for yes. on this. So <laughs> we have to give that to her later. Yeah. Or she's just, she's so elated. <laughs> All right. So, okay, we'll move along to, uh, where is it? Item number four, potential 2023 annual town meeting warrant article, Department of Energy Resources Municipal Opt-in specialized, specialized Stretch Code of 2022. Um, this is uh, being brought to us, presented to us by the Climate Action Advisory um, Board, CAB. And who do we have? Yeah, Brad. Yes, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Brad, please uh, take some time. Tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself and about this. And I have uh, four slides to show if if that would help. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Brad Hubbard Nelson. I'm from. I live at uh, 221 Shawtuck Road. I'm a member of uh, Climate Action Board CAB. I'm not presenting it for CAB because we haven't discussed it yet. We're going to be discussing it tomorrow, um, but we wanted to discuss we. I agreed to write something up. I've gotten some input. Uh, if I could, ju I'll just try to share the screen, see how that works. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, can everybody see that pretty well? Yep. yep. We'll slide. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, let me. I've. Uh, I'm a new member of the CAB. I've been on uh, CSEC for a number of years, and I overlapped with Sue Felschen. So she's actually somewhat familiar with this stuff, I think. Um, our proposed warrant article text, which has not been submitted yet, is to determine whether the town will vote to adopt the DOER's municipal opt-in stretch, specialized stretch code of 2022 as the building code for new construction of residential, multifamily, commercial structures, effective uh, the start of uh, 2024. Uh, as, I, as I said, neither of board has uh, really discussed this in detail yet. A um, little background information. Concord adopted the original stretch energy code uh, in 2010 as a requirement for being designated as a green community. Uh, most of the towns in Massachusetts use the stretch co energy code, uh, which requires a number of things, including a HERS rating of around fi of 55, I think, as uh, which is a bit better than the base energy code. Last year, uh, the DOER released an update to the stretch energy building code required by the Climate Act of 2021. And the details are uh, that there's many details, of course, uh, that can be found on this website. I'll show uh, just a few details. Um, the updated building code improves energy efficiency compared with the prior stretch building code. There hasn't been really update to the stretch code in quite a number of years. And it also provides an opt-in for communities to adopt this specialized stretch code, which was required by the Climate Act as a they were trying to go for something like a net zero emissions building code. Um, and it makes it use of advanced build more advanced building science such as passive house standards and uh, electric heating technology like heat pumps. Now adopting this opt-in specialized stretch code requires a town meeting vote. And I don't know how familiar you are. I think you're probably more familiar with building codes than I am. Um, there's different for different codes for residential and for commercial. And uh, sorry if this text is kind of small, uh, there's uh, somewhat differences for dwellings up to 4,000 square feet and above. And for each one, there's multiple pathways and all electric pathways defined 
that has to have a HERS rating of 45 or better or use passive house standards. Uh, it also requires, uh, um, and that's for either the stretch code or the specialized opt-in code. So there's different columns for that, for both of those. Um, the, uh, the new stretch code requires a, a wiring for uh, EV in a parking space. That would be 220 volts, uh, presumably uh, 50 amps or something. Um, and uh, so there's there's two pathways, as I said, there's an all electric pathway and a mixed fuel pathway. The mixed fuel is, uh, you know, allows you to use gas, uh, but requires a better HERS rating. It also requires pre-wiring for electric in the specialized opt-in code. So the idea is maybe you could install a natural gas, but uh, the state has a goal of getting to net zero emissions in 2050. So you build the house such that it's ready to go for uh, being all electric. Um, and in this case, if for a mixed fuel case, it also requires you uh, to install solar PV um, in most cases. Um, and for dwellings above 4,000 uh, square feet, it's kind of pretty much the same. Uh, there's, they actually uh, require, for the specialized code, requires HERS zero, meaning uh, net zero emissions, where solar PV or renewables uh, basically offset any emissions from, the, um, from uh, fossil fuel if you, have, if you use it. Um, so there's a lot of details here. There's even more details for commercial, and I'm not really going to go through this slide except to say that there's codes for offices and schools, hospitals and labs, multifamily above 12,000 square feet, and small commercial, all with the same sort of all-electric pathway or mixed fuel pathway. Um, so uh, the... So there's uh, there are a lot of details, uh, of course. Now, Concord's Climate Action Plan, which the CAB uh, uh, initiated with a consultant a couple of years ago, uh, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% uh, uh, by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And electrification of buildings and transportation is our, the primary mechanism to uh, achieve this. Um, as a town, we voted in 2021, Article 31, to adopt a fossil-free bylaw for new construction. Uh, this is separate than what I'm talking about, but it is complementary to it. And the 2021 Climate Act exempts up to 10 communities that have to kind of be approved for this, uh, for not allowing, uh, allows, let's see, exempt them from allowing fossil fuel connected buildings. Uh, Governor Baker was not uh, a fan of disallowing fossil fuel buildings. Uh, so um, now this exemption is not connected with the article that I'm talking about, but it's somehow related and it's a confusing, it may be a confusing point for uh, some people. Uh, but I would say that choosing to opt into the specialized stretch code would complement that article with improved energy efficiency standards for the buildings and ensure minimal greenhouse gas emissions from new buildings going forwards. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to say this evening. I'm not, uh, I'd, I'd love any input you have into um, what the warrant article should say or uh, what, uh, what, you'd, what you might need to uh, know um, uh, more about it. Thank you for that. I, I just want to actually take a step back and talk about the mechanics of how this is going to get through to this year's or this upcoming year's town meeting. So you still need this still needs to go back to cab to get sort of ironed out, finalized. And then it where where are we in terms of is cab going to be um, basically putting this through to town meeting as as a standalone warrant article or are you going to be doing this through the select board what what pathway has I, been decided i believe that part of the next meeting with within cab right i think there's some decisions to be made i believe it will be moved by the select board 
Um, and I believe that the 2010 article was moved by the select board as well. Yes. Yeah. Sue might um, be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so actually what um, I found out that um, it wasn't, it was um, CSEC that actually moved, actually put forth the 2010 warrant article through the select board. Um, and it was it was actually um, a CSEC member who moved it on the floor of town meeting, but it was through the select board um, that they designated CSEC to um, put forth that warrant article, which is, I, I believe, how the process will happen um, again this time. Okay. And how are we looking on time? When, when is the, when I does this need to be in by? Um, so draft warrant articles are um, due by um, the this Friday, the 16th. Uh, but and then final warrant articles, the warrant closes um, on January 4th. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is CAB has a meeting tomorrow. You're going to have your draft version that's going to go in on Friday. I, I'm just I'm walking through making sure this is going to get going to hit all the marks. <laughs> in terms of yeah, time. The, um, the drafts are due only um, to allow um, town council to uh, review the warrant articles to make sure there's no fatal flaws, um, you know, before they get actually submitted to the warrant. Uh, it's easier to correct a draft warrant article than it is to correct a final um, article once it's been submitted. Um, so, you know, CAB will meet tomorrow um, and, you know, they'll submit their draft. They may, they may have to have an extra quick meeting before January 4th if town council comes back with any recommended changes to the the article the warrant article itself um, not necessarily you know an explanation um, but just the actual warrant article itself um, before the warrant closes on the fourth okay okay good just and then it sure will be aware of the of the of the time crunch for this. <laughs> so, and then, um, it, you know, it will be um, part of the select board's public hearing for town meeting. Um, but I imagine, you know, between, um, you know, March and, you know, usually it's the planning board um, has their, have their required public hearing in March. And typically at that meeting, um, the board also discusses whether they wish to take a position on other warrant articles. Um, so that would happen at the public hearing in March. Okay. Great. Are there any questions from uh, any other board members? Yes, from Linda. Yep, go ahead. Um, I just the wording that you have for new construction of residential, multifamily, and commercial structures. I, maybe just think about that. I'm not sure that multifamily isn't residential. And then what about mixed use? I'm, I'm just not sure maybe Elizabeth could help with wording that would be encompassing um, it, or, or maybe that's, that's how they have it in the, um, but, but I tend to think that maybe we need some thinking about just um, how that's described in, in terms so of the article. Yeah, and, and so this would be a, you know, a conversation, um, you know, with you know, CAB and, uh, you know, what the full intention is be, you know, uh, is for the article. Um, it's either, um, higher higher level words which encompass everything. So residential would be single family, multifamily, um, two family. Um, so that would encompass all residential. Um, or you know whether you you take the description down to single family, two family, multifamily. Those are three different types of you know residential structures. Um, then there is um, there's you know commercial structures and then there's mixed use structures, which is you know residential and commercial projects. 
So that's that distinction. Okay. I noticed this too. And um, I had in mind that given the short timeline for the warrant closing, you can always change your motion later to make it a apply less strongly, but you can't make it apply more strongly. So if it turned out you left out mixed use and you needed to add it, you couldn't because that would um, uh, expand the four corners of the article. Whereas um, if you decided that rather than saying residential and multifamily, you were just going to say residential because it includes multifamily, you could include that in the motion. So whatever changes you make, um, Throwing so in too I'd, much is better. Yeah, I I would um you know so this is not you know the planning board's article and it's you know as far as you know um you know I don't think this is at a, a point for the planning board to discuss um, the article. I would suggest um, to Brad that you pose that when you submit the draft, um you yep. pose that question specifically to town council on um you know having the more inclusive language, because uh, all articles are also reviewed by the moderator, who is, is the ultimate decision on whether an amendment on the floor of town meeting is within the scope of the article um, with input from town council. So um, whether you make it mo most inclusive, which would be residential, mixed use and commercial, which would encompass you know, every structure in town. Um, yeah. And then, you know, whether, you know, if there is an amendment on the floor of town meeting, um, going back from that to, um, you know, exclude or, or you know, single family or exclude multifamily or exclude single family or exclude mixed use or, but so that's a conversation that um, CAB should probably have and then pose that question to uh, town council and the town moderator. Now, question for you. Uh... I don't, I don't know. I'm going to look into the building code uh, and see if they talk about mixed use. If there's a building that's mixed use, uh, is it obvious which code applies to it? Uh, and I'll have to look at that. Um, which code as far as the, um, the, which the inner, the commercial code or yeah, the so residential there's, commercial, code? there's commercial downstairs and residential upstairs. Do you have a different building standard upstairs than downstairs? Is that the way it would normally work? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. That's that would be you know a, a quick question for the building commissioner. Um, I believe the the building code has specific requirements when it is a mixed use building. Okay, good. As and as it in, instead of whether it's all residential or all commercial, um, I'm I'm fairly certain the building code has very specific requirements when it's mixed use. Okay, thank you. Shouldn't we wait until we see the warrant article before we decide whether we will support it or not? Um, yes, I I think this was. Um, um, you know, you know this is, is this is, this is okay. something that um, yeah. you know had had you know has had a lot of discussion, and I think right. um, you know having Brad come and just giving a heads up to the planning board that yeah, no, I think it's great. I think yeah. obviously I think we should probably let the town vote on whether they want to do it or not. But so. well, I Brad, I'm glad you shopped it around and brought it to us tonight because this is the first I had seen it. I actually have a couple of questions and comments about the explanation box, but I assume I should email you and take it up offline, Brad, rather than take up the meeting's time for wordsmithing. That would be fine with me. Totally fine. All right. Yeah, I don't think we, we're not, we're not taking any sort of action on this at this point. So this was just a informative opportunity. Um, and I appreciate Brad, you taking the time to, uh, yeah, share this with us. And I look forward to it, hopefully going, uh, getting all the way through. <laughs> Likewise, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I do see we have one uh, public comment question about this. Um, and since this is a new item, uh, Carol, go ahead. 
Great. Sorry, my um, internet's a little slow here. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so this, um, I had a question in line with what Elizabeth and what um, Susan was bringing up, that um, because um, there's been discussion of what's included and what's not included, so uh, I'd be very interested to see, um, because there's a warrant for the combined business residence, which is going to bring a lot of housing um, to Concord if that passes. I wanted to see if this article would uh, be applicable to that and how it would be applicable, sort of the first question. And then the second question is, does it include affordable housing or does it not include affordable housing? Ms. Savoy, did you identify yourself for the public? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so I needed to get at, called on and ask my question. Um, I'm Carol Savoy, 61 Belknap Street. Thank you, Sue, for reminding me of that etiquette. Um, so yeah, I just want some clarification. Um, do you know, Brad, if it includes affordable housing now, or is that something you have to look into? I I assume the building code applies to all housing, but um, I think people on the planning board might know more about that than me. Does the regular stretch code apply to all, all housing? Um, I... I believe I believe so. I don't I don't know. I'm not um I'm, I'm definitely not that, that would be that would be a good question to ask the building commissioner. There's certain things I know a little bit about but don't want to know any more and that's the food code and the building code. <laughs> Okay, and then do you know Brad if this uh applies to the combined business residence um article, which would have a mix of uh, commercial and residential. I think that was a question um, Linda had asked earlier, um, just trying to get a feel for that. I would assume that it does if it's after uh, 2024. Uh, it affects uh, any building you pull a permit for and build. I think based on the co the conversation that was just taking place, as long as the language of the warrant were to include um, residential, mixed use, and commercial, then it, for Concord's purposes, it would be extended to those. Yeah, and and I guess uh, what I'm trying to do, I, whoever was mentioning that it's probably, uh, I think it was Elizabeth to have you know be more broad or more inclusive because or sue that you can you can you can't add but you can subtract or whatever but since we're building a lot of housing we don't know what the housing is going to be um you know and what form it's going to be that um it would be great to include all the new housing that we're going to be building with the combined business residence and all the new affordable housing that we're putting forth so that would be great thank you thank you Thank you, Carol. And thank you again, Brad. Appreciate it. All right. On to the fifth item is a follow up on the uh, mobile food establishments, uh, food truck um, uh, bylaw amendment. Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to? Oh, you're muted still. Um, so attached is um, the uh, board got sent um, a revised draft bylaw, again, based on um, feedback I got from uh, people in the community, additional input from the public health director, and um, the most of the changes um, we're in the explanation, but in the warrant itself, um, item C, the feedback I got from one um, actual you know, restaurant owner as well as the public health director was to um, previously it just said a mobile food establishment um, was limited to 52 days a year. Uh, and the comment came back and the reason for that amendment for, um, to include you know, an operator and or property was the example given 
Um, you may have um, Tico's taco truck and Tico has nine taco trucks. And mm -hmm. it's not that each taco truck can go someplace yes. in Concord for 52 days. It's you know, that operator. And then the same thing with each individual property. It's like the library couldn't have um, taco truck on Tuesday, falafel truck on Wednesday, pizza truck on Thursday, and, and do that every single day. So um, that's why that um, change was put in there to you know address, um, again, trying to find that balance between allowing um, you know mobile food establishments at, on this you know temporary basis and respecting what um, the restaurant owners do. Um, and um, this second correction right here was it said food truck and just to be consistent, changed it to mobile food establishment. And then item E um, I brought up for discussion. Previously, it just said parking on a public road is prohibited. And then somebody could go through um, a special permit process to get um, relief from the um, no more than two mobile food establishments on a property in case there you know, was, let's say, um, you know, Ag Day was held at Verrill Farm and um, Verrill Farm wanted to have a bunch of different um, food trucks, more than two. Uh, they could go through the special permit process to get relief from item D. Previously, there was also item E about parking on a public road. Um, as I thought through the permitting process, um, it, it really is not a zoning item on whether a food truck can park on a public road. Um, the Board of Appeals does not have any jurisdiction over who can and who cannot park on a public road. So um, I felt that if there was a type of event, um, um, Porch Fest and, you know, Porch Fest wanted to go through and have, you know, more than two food trucks parked at various places in West Concord um, and also wanted to have a couple of food trucks parked on the public road, they would need to go through the Board of Appeals for the granting of relief from item D, no more than two food establishments. But it would be up to the select board whether they wanted to allow um, a food truck to park on a public road. And, and that would be part of that process. The Board of Appeals would accept and you know, take in an application for a special permit, and that person would have to have already gone through the select board to get authorization to park on a public road. Um, so I think um, adding adding this section under item E, um, I then don't think you need to also have it down here um, in the um, granting of relief section. So I just I put that out there for the board's you know discussion. Okay. Do we want to have do we want to talk now or let's work through the the, the yeah, rest? The of only it? the only other change was um was just clarifying that if somebody wanted to have a mobile food establishment as an accessory use to a restaurant, the restaurant has to be in Concord. Yeah. Um, and then it was just um you know additional. Um, changes to the explanation based on feedback that I've um, I have received, and I I did have a chance to speak to another restaurant owner um, today, and um, about this and the um, and fast food uh, restaurant amendment, and um, he is was generally in support of both of these. He was going to take um, a much more detailed look and provide comments back to me before the board's meeting on January 3rd. Great. So my my question was um, sort of around the, the porch fest or you have it there to the tree lighting ceremony, that sort of thing where there are a lot of people and it's not, it's not really limited to a particular property. So what, 
if in that scenario there's a food truck vendor who's not directly affiliated with the organization or organizations that are putting on the event who wants to be able to have their food truck either you know on the street or adjoining street where these events are taking place how do they i mean they still have to go through the same process i get that but can I guess, how would that work? So if there's a separate one that isn't like, isn't uh, affiliated with or sponsored by Porch Fest, we'll just stick for that, uh, stick with that as the example, um, can they still go to uh, the select board and ask for the ability to park their food truck on a street that just happens to be one of the ones that Porch Fest is doing and that, that there's a one of the bands playing for Porch Fest? Um, so, I mean, they, they would, um, they they could still go through, you know, make the request to the select board, um, you know, but the the permitting side of this through the police department and the health division, um, they you they will either have to have the authorization from the select board to park on a public road, or they have to have you know written authorization from a property owner to park on you know on on, on that property. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, you know, there is, you know, that checks, you know, check and balance. Um, and, you know, I, how I envision this, let's say, you know, let's, you know, let's think about, you know, Porch Fest and um, they've been working with a, you know, a bunch of um, vendors and, and the local restaurants um, to, to come up with, you know, uh, a, a scheme that works for everybody and finds that balance, then if, you know, Tico's Taco goes to the select board and says, hey, you know, this weekend I want to, you know, I want to park up on Church Street. The select board's, you know, no, <laughs> we have, we have Porch Fest. We have, you know, all these vendors that have been working with the West Concord Advisory Committee and the West Concord Junction Cultural District. And, um, you know, there's already going to be, you know, 10 food trucks along with the restaurants that are going to be, you know, open. And um, so, I mean, it, it, there, there was going to have to be that informative process, but that's how I would envision it happening. Okay. I didn't know. I just didn't understand sort of the mechanism that would be in place in basically exactly what you just outlined for them to, uh, you know, basically lay the groundwork to deny uh, a permit for them to be there. I, I, it's beyond my understanding. So I appreciate the, the walkthrough on that. But I do have a follow-up question on that, which is um, if we take um, item E away from special permitting on the grounds that it's covered by the select board authorizing it. Is there a standard process for the select board to authorize things or do we need to specify anything about that? Um, no, so I mean, I would, I would never specify in zoning another board committee or department's application process. Um, so, okay. so the, we'll board, the select that. board, the select board may decide that you need a license. They may decide you need a permit. They may decide that you just need to make a request and they vote. I, I don't, um, I don't know what their process is going to be. There currently isn't one. So, um, you know, they, they will get to decide what that process is going to be. Okay. I, right. I imagine, I, I would imagine it's either probably going to be a it, it will probably be a, a permit or a license process that somebody applies for, kind of like a one-day liquor license. Okay, great. I did have another question if about um, the addition of In Concord, but maybe we should finish discussing um, the previous page changes first. Sure. I don't have any other questions. So, Sue, if you're the only one, I think. I have, I have a question, um, and, and it's just um, if a mobile food establishment um, gets approval from the Board of Health um, and gets approval from a private residence, could they set up 
on that private residence and and um, charge for food? I mean, I, I sort of understand on a private residence, if you're having a wedding or a graduation party or whatever, um, that, you know, that's, that's not going to upset anybody. But if you have a private rev residence that's on a, you know, busy, fronts on a busy street or across from a park or something, it would be odd to have them you know, charging for hamburgers and hot dogs on a summer day. So um, I, I, there's, there's, there's no intention in zoning to regulate whether somebody can charge for their services or goods. So I, I, I'm going to assume that if, you know, 52 days a year, a property owner wants to have a food truck come because they, you know, they like Tico's tacos and he sets up for a couple of hours at lunchtime and that property owner pays for food and other people come and buy food. I, I think, I think that's, I think that is the reason you're, you're trying to find that balance between what, you know, is, you know, is 52 days a year too much? Is 52 days, you know, should it be, you know, you know, 30, you know, 30, 60, I don't know. I mean, you have the, you have to start with a number somewhere and, and maybe that's part of the conversation, um, you know, during the public hearing and, um, you know, one, one restaurant owner I talked to thought, you know, possibly 52 days a year was a little too much. And the other one, you know, was, you know, fine one day a week. Um, I don't I don't think under zoning you could include somebody something that says you know so long as the per, you know so long as that vendor isn't charging. Right, but right now we have um commercial and residential zones so that for example you can't set up a restaurant in your house um and have people coming all times of night and day well day and parking on your lawn and enjoying the food um but this essentially would be an easy way to run a restaurant legally off your front yard, but well, only 52 no. days a year. No, no, you no, you could not unless you actually had a restaurant in Concord because that that food truck has to go someplace. Yeah, you can't run a food truck out of your house. Right, it would have to go away at night but um, you could have it drive in every day and go away every night and park. Well, actually that does bring up my next question, which was where you said you added in Concord mm -hmm. below. So the intent is in fact, to make sure that every food truck is an accessory use of a Concord restaurant and not somebody else's um, restaurant. No, uh, well, so so you can't you can't run a food truck out of, a house um it that it's just that's not possible under the food code right when i said run it out of a house what i meant was um uh have it come to the house for for its sales but the truck would have to be serviced elsewhere and parked elsewhere and stocked elsewhere um if if so so part of this is you know it's it's not just thinking about um you know the the zoning it's the feasibility is you know is it is it feasible you know financially is it feasible that somebody um tico's tacos he owns a house in concord his truck and his you know and his base of you know operation is in waltham and he brings his taco truck to his house 52 days a year um, I, I, is that, you know, is that possible? It, it's possible. Is it likely? I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's terribly likely is he either. I just wanted to understand exactly what we were talking about. So what I also think the, you know, the, these sorts of things are the initial guidelines. Is it possible that all of a sudden there's 
one person or a multitude of people that are bringing in food trucks uh, to sit on their driveway for 52 days out of the year? I, I don't think so, but if that were to happen, then this could always be revised. And all the more reason to put it forward as soon as possible so that we can get it settled before the um, 250th anniversary. Um, to, to your point, this last section um, right here. Mm -hmm. um, so an accessory used to a restaurant in Concord um, is specifically to allow an existing restaurant owner to have a food truck associated with their restaurant um, because currently under zoning, um, it has to do with the food code and um, the zoning has to allow a, a mobile food establishment to be part of a restaurant so that under the food code, that restaurant can go through the permitting process to be a commissary for the base of operation for that food truck. So if, it, if it's not, if it's, if the food truck is not permitted to be associated with the restaurant, um, then you can't have you know, reasons to be cheerful or Adelita's would not be able to have a food truck parked at the restaurant. Okay, the but, this, the but this addition of in Concord does not actually precludes a, a food truck from outside of Concord from um, locating itself it, it in does Concord not, as long correct. as it's properly permitted through other means. Okay, correct. that was what I was wondering yeah. about. Then this seems good to me. Yeah, this, this added sentence under the definition of restaurant has more to do with um, allowing existing restaurant owners in Concord in the, the option to have a food truck for that restaurant and have it be able to be serviced out of that restaurant. Right, I remember when you first, um, uh, uh, when we first had this on our agenda, you pointed out that it's just not possible under current bylaw for Correct. any Concord restaurant to have any food truck period. Yeah. And Correct. so this is what would allow it, which is great. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from or comments from board members? And we do we need to do anything else? I know we're obviously. Um, uh, no. Um, no, I mean, I what will happen is I'm, you know, I'm still hopefully getting input from, you know, from different people. Um, I will um, finalize this draft warrant. Yeah. Well, and the other two for your uh, meeting on January 3rd. Um, and then at that meeting, you know, if there's any other tweaks to the explanation or, um, you know, the board would make those final changes and then vote to um, submit these warrant articles for the 2023 annual town meeting. Okay, great. Well, I'm still trying to figure out if Can you... I... Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, just one question. You know, part of this process, I think, is to control it, um, as we've talked about. What role do the police have in determining the licenses and permits, Elizabeth? Do you know that? Um, so uh, once again, kind of like the building code and the food code, I know enough that um, okay, I, I the police. That the, I was just curious. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. The police um, department, um, they're required to get a peddler's and hawker's license. Um, okay. So yeah, it's, right. it, it's a fairly... It's a fairly simple license for most food, uh, mobile food establishment um, operators. Each, each, and from what I understand, it's not, it's the actual operator of each food truck. So it's by, it's person, it's, it's person based, the peddler and hawkler's license. Um, and then there is an added, um, I believe there's an added Corey check um, specifically under that's allowed under the state law regarding ice cream truck vendors. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. 
I, I see that as part of the sale phase, sale phase to it is to control, you know, who comes in and, you know, what goes on there. That's all. Thank you. Yep. I'm still just trying to determine, Elizabeth, whether you really like Chico's tacos or you really don't. <laughs> It's, I'm not so sure it's politically correct, okay, but. <laughs> um, no, I think that's the name of the taco truck that parks at the farm stand in Littleton. Okay. Is it? Oh. So I, I, can, there's all, I can't remember, I just can't remember. I would have said Carmine Subs or something. I mean, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I just can't remember the name of the, the hot dog truck. Um, but I don't, um, Nathan, did you want, so I know um, there's a hand up from whether you want to take comp questions on each one as we go along or I just think fine by that me. Might, might be easier. And it's just, okay. just the one for right now. So uh, Stephen Bader, yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I suspect Elizabeth is going to say this is the food department, not the zoning. But uh, my question is, has, and I'm late to the discussion, has there been any discussion of the trash generated by food trucks and I and whether public works has reached out to you or you've reached out to public works I, I don't know quite where the trash from these food trucks will end up but it may not end up where we think it will um, so uh, that actually um, is a specific requirement um, so each food truck is required to go through the health division part of that permitting process for um, each food truck. Um, and I believe it's part of their um, base of operations license, which is um, the license, the community where the food truck resides at the end of the day. And um, but under the food code, there are specific requirements for um, each truck, as far as um, hand sinks and potable water and holding tanks, and they have to have um, specific provisions for um, where you know trash can be disposed of for that food truck. Um, and so, it, it it part of the license for the food truck. There is um, requirements that they be able to handle trash associated with that food truck and be able to take it, store it on the truck, bring it back to their base of operation and dispose of it. Um, so that's why the community that issues the base of operations, um, you're talking about that food truck gets evaluated for its food truck license. The restaurant gets evaluated for um, its ability to be able to handle not only the restaurant operation, but the operation of the food truck and trash is one of those things where they have to be able to accommodate that. I hate to play the bad guy, but I believe it's required by state law and not a mere matter of etiquette that people identify their name and address. Yes, so, thank you, Sue. I'm being horrible about that today. Yes. And and I'm I'm remiss as well. Stephen Bader, Seven River Street. Sorry, Sue. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. She's on it tonight. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Steve. Thank you. All right, yes, let's uh, move along to fat, fast food. Oh, you're on mute. Um, so I did not make any changes to the bylaw language itself from the previous version. Okay. Um, I did make you know additional uh, from comments coming in, you know, additional clarification in the explanation itself. Mm -hmm. um, and as I stated in my agenda memo, I also took out that the table um, as far as the metrics for the parking because as I was going through, I, I'm still trying to get additional examples 
Um, but I felt that was probably something that was better suited for the public hearing presentation on how the board got there than sure. having to put that explanation. Um, the explanation for the warrant article is more the, you know, why are, you know, why are we doing this? And, and not necessarily all of the history behind how you got to um, the, the actual language in the bylaw amendment. But yeah. as it relates to the parking, um, that was in my agenda memo and I can bring that up yeah. as well. Um, I was able to um, get more uh, information. I talked to the owner of Bedford Farms ice cream, and um, he was, um, I, I sent him the, um, the draft bylaws, and I'm waiting to hear back from him as well. But you know, his initial reaction is that he was definitely in support, um, you know, of this, and based on the the metric as far as the number of employees he had on the largest shift and the seats, and then the square footage. I have not been able to confirm. Um, I included the unfinished basement. Um, I have not been able to confirm, um, you know, whether that is um, can be finished and used as far as like storage or whether it may you know be used for storage of dry goods. It can't be used under the food code. It can't be used for um, other purposes, but I have not been able to confirm um, with the health division whether, you know, how that basement's used. So I just included it. Um, and so, you know, the the metric for parking, um, you know, se seem, seems, seems to still be right. So I'm still hoping to get a couple of more examples um, before, um, before the third. <laughs> Uh, just to make sure that the metric as far as uh, one space per employee on the largest shift and one space per 300 square feet is consistent with a regular restaurant um, and a fast food restaurant. Yes, Linda. I have a question for for places that may not in the past have been considered a restaurant, and I'm thinking of places like Crosby's or, or um, the Concord Market, you know, where they might have food now that you consider that they'd take out, would that affect then their parking requirements or would that? No, because, um, you know, Crosby's and Concord Market will, um, their principal use will always be retail. Yeah. Okay, so it's driven by the principal use. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And and if but then if someone's principal use is a restaurant, would then the fast food restaurant affect them as well? Um, or not? No, I mean it would. It it comes down to you know it comes down to the definition. Um, so I, I'll. Um, so again, it 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 comes down to, you know, you're either a restaurant with table, you know, em, employee to a table, um, cafeteria, or you know, fast food. So it's it, it it it's it's how you define your business in you know one of these three categories. Okay, so there'll still be three categories. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. So I actually I actually think it provides um, more it it provides more flexibility for a restaurant owner on how they want to set up their operation. Um, you know, take Saltbox Kitchen. Um, his his operation. You know, he's 
you know, required to have at least, you know, currently to be a restaurant, not fast food, 12 seats, but, um, you know, maybe for his operation, um, it, you know, 10 seats works better and he can change a little corner to, you know, allow, a, um, you know, a pickup counter for pre-made sandwiches. So, you know, he has the flexibility to figure out, you know, how he wants to manage and operate the restaurant and not have it be based on the fact that, well, you have to have at least 12 seats and 51% of your business has to be people sitting down. Um, you know, with, with COVID, you know, th things changed. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't see, I don't see everybody going back to wanting to sit, you know, in a restaurant for a couple of hours that close to people. <laughs> so I, I, I think having the three, you know, three types of, you know, what we classify as a restaurant gives that restaurant owner the flexibility to figure out what works for their business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think COVID aside, I think that's just a business model that is grown in popularity in terms of having access to good, good food options like salt box, for example, that you can pick up in that manner and, and, but consume at home, uh, yeah, it's gotten a lot more popular. All right, any other um, board else? questions or comments? So I can, um, and then... Combined, onto the combined business residence. <clears throat> So the only uh, the only two changes was to um, correctly state it's the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, um, and then um, again um, changing the explanation based on comments and questions that have uh, received. Um, the highlighted section is um, I got uh, Claire uh, from Sue. Um, a uh, clarifying this sentence, which kind of didn't make sense and the way sh she suggested it um, made much more sense. So that was the only other change. Any questions or comments from board members? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have any either. We're still waiting to get feedback from housing groups around town about whether they support the specific percentages we're putting forward. Is that true? Um, yes. Okay. Thanks. I think I, I did hear that Boston is now going the other way and, and, um, proposing that their affordable housing percentage go with a 13% up to 20%. I think I, I, I heard that on the news. So it's not been passed, but I think they're considering that change. I just thought I'd throw that in as background. Yeah, it's, um, it, it would be, it would be very, very difficult to, compare um, yeah. any so requirement Boston. that Boston has to <laughs> yeah. conquer because yeah. yeah. um, yeah. they they have the wonderful ability of vertical housing mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah. I, think they, I think they are also dealing with you know there there are whole floors of office buildings um, that are are not going to be reoccupied right. Um, right. So I think they are looking for ways to diversify and um, those unoccupied floors in those office buildings. And, um, and this is a way to do that. But they're probably not talking about one or two or three units. They're probably talking about 
a lot more, which our bylaw, in fact, would cover under 20% if we had such large spaces. That's right, Elizabeth? Um, yes, I mean, they're, they're, they're talking hundreds and hundreds of units at a time. Wow, yeah. All right, if there are no other questions or comments from board members, we'll take quick um, public comment. Uh, Carol, I see your hand up. Before Sue jumps in, please reintroduce yourself and your address. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan, for reminding me. Uh, Carol Savoy, 61 Belknap Street. Um, I was looking at um, where you're, I guess you're showing right now, Elizabeth, and it says, don't scroll, I'm just, Okay, uh, it's the last paragraph, first sentence. It says the housing production plan shows a great need for small units at every price point near town centers. Um, could we put the word all in front of town centers? So people understand and then after the word town centers, you see what I'm talking about, right where your cursor is near all, all town centers. I, for one, would rather not do that on the grounds that it's debatable whether Nine Acre Corner is a town center or not. And um, I think it's clear enough that town centers means whatever people feel town centers are. I, I, I don't know what other people on the board think. Um, I, I can tell you from a planning perspective, um, Nine Acre Corner is considered a, a business district. It's not considered a town center. Mm. Okay. So, well, so then all town centers would be, or uh, maybe- Concord Center, um, Throw Depot, West Concord Business and West Concord Village. Right. So maybe you could do a parentheses after center and just list them as you just did. So it's clear to everybody what we're talking about here. Because I want people to understand that you know, this is goodness. We're going to get all this affordable housing across the whole town, right? So they understand it's not just the Row Business District or West Concord. We're going to have some in, you know, the ones you just listed, right? Well, I, I, I would hope people would are going to actually read the housing production plan, so they should have an understanding of that. But I would also hope that people know that. Concord Center is a town center. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. If people read it fast, they'll just say, yeah, whatever. You know, oh, that means West Concord and, and Thoreau Business District. And the housing production plan um, is, you know, 114 pages. I doubt most people will take the time to read it. And one of the corrections I was going to make on it, it just says on, on one of the items, page 15, item eight, it just says, in Concord and doesn't explain what Concord is. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I think it would be good to define it. You know, it can't hurt. You know, you're explaining things to people. People read these things and, you know, just read them quickly and don't know what they mean. So if you define it for them, they'll know exactly what you mean. I'm sure we'll put up um, uh, information as part of our town meeting presentation. When, and as part of our um, hearing that we will hold in the in February. Yeah, but or not tonight. everybody will go to the hearing. Not everybody will go to town we'll meeting. We'll go to town meeting. That's, uh, but so if that's why when you get the warrant, the meeting, town meeting. <laughs> then they don't get to vote anyway. <laughs> exactly. My point was when you get the warrant in the mail and you look at what they are, and you say, am I interested enough to go to town meeting to vote on this if you understand what it means? Right. Some people won't go to the won't go to the the hearing, but they'll see the thing in the mail and they'll say, oh, that means everything. Uh, you know, I like that. I don't like it. I want to go vote for it. Right. So that's why the warrant is important, because that's kind of what people give a cursory pass at to see if they're interested enough to to go vote. So since we want to get, you know, a lot of people to vote on this and we want people to understand, you know, we're going to get a lot of housing from this and a lot of affordable housing that you would think you would want to, you know, make people aware of that. 
Oh, Carol, I wish. I think we'd be lucky to get a handful of units out of this. I know. I, uh, I don't think change. we're going to get. I don't think we're going to get anything with the you know uh, currently. But um, the the other uh, you know the, that's my one suggestion on that. And then on the first sentence, it says the housing production plan shows a great need for small units at every price point. It also shows that we're not going to hit our ten percent SHI, and I think we need to spell that out. I mean, that's the. The major message that came from the how the you know the housing production plan that it's not as of May next year we're not going to be at ten percent as SHI, right? And we need to do something about it. So it doesn't just say hey we need small units at every price point. It says we need a lot of units. We need at least thirty five one year and another thirty five the next year for 70 units in two years of affordable housing towards SHI to meet the 10%. Um, well, we also no, need that's affordable not, housing yeah. for so, other reasons. So, so let, me, let me clarify, and this is this is a reason why um, I, I don't think it's appropriate to put um, anything of that nature in this ex explanation for the warrant. Um, the correction is once you have an approved housing production plan, um, the communities can... Um, make progress towards their 10% by um, developing a certain number of units every year as that progress. We don't currently, and, and I believe for Concord, that progress is currently 35 units a year. If you have, it's called, you know, safe harbor. Um, if you have an approved housing production plan, we won't, we will not know until the actual new SHI comes out in May, how many units we need to build to get beyond 10%. Um, we, at, at this point, you know, it, it, it could be anywhere between, you know, eight and, and 85, um, 90. We don't know because um, part of the, Part of the SHI count also goes to like um, group homes, and we don't know how many group homes there are in Concord, um, and or you know whether some have left, some have not. Um, there's we've lost um, quite a few units, expiring units where their affordable deed restriction was not in perpetuity, and they left, and so we won't we won't know for sure how many units we need to get to 10 percent until those figures come out um it's you know it's our you know it's our estimate because junction village christopher heights is not going forward it's our our estimate that yeah we're more than likely we're going to fall below 10 percent just based on the number of new housing units that have been built since the 2010 census but we won't know what that number is of how many we need to get over the 10 percent until those figures come out got it but i guess what i'm trying to say is it it shows the housing plan shows number one we are not going to be at 10 percent shi by may 2023 we're not going to say how much below it's, it's likely it's likely that we will be below 10 percent Right. So that's why I was saying you should say that here, saying it is likely that it shows that it's likely we will below, be below the 10% SHI and it shows a number of small units. I just think people need to know that we're not going to hit SHI and we need those SHI units, right? Or we're open to unfavorable or whatever you call it, 40B development where we don't want it, right? Um, well, we we need a lot of SHI units, so um, right. And we need them not only to stay um, above ten percent affordability, but also because we desperately need affordable housing and for people living in Concord. Right. No, I agree with all of that. I'm just saying that we need to let people know that we're not going to be at ten percent. Um, and then when you scroll down, the 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 the. the uh, is that I'm trying to see where you are? The reduction affordability, both affordable and small commercial while improving. So that sentence where it says while improving or maintaining the town's affordability ratio, how 
are we improving the town's affordability ratio when we're reducing the number of SHI units here? Because units don't get built. Developers would rather not build any housing units at all than make an entire affordable unit in a very small project. Exactly. Right, but you're, what you're doing is increasing the number of units being built, just general units, market rate, right? Like one to four units, you don't need any affordable housing, you just pay into the affordable housing trust, right? So now you got four units of market rate and zero units that are SHI affordable, zero. And money in the trust that can be used to buy down, for example, a unit that is whose affordability is expiring. Right, but you're only getting, let's say 10% of okay. half a million bucks, like 50 grand. That's not gonna buy down much in Concord, right? It's better if you get half a million, right? So, it's not really moving the needle. So how could you say that you're really improving the town's affordability ratio because you're allowing more units to be built at less than 10%. And then of the the larger So, so Carol, I I'm 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 gonna step back because from a planning perspective, um, we have no idea how many units um zoning is going to um, create. Developers are gonna, you know, currently nothing is being built. There is no new housing that's of um, any affordability range for anybody to move into Concord. So um, I'm not gonna, you know, the, you know, have a debate about this. I, I think you, you should be going to all the other, you know, the housing advocates and their meetings and have these conversations with them because there's support for just building housing, whether it's affordable, you know, SHI or or not having these smaller units okay. built and getting families in town, you know, there's a lot of people that are supportive of that. I don't think this is the appropriate place currently for the board to have a debate while we're just trying to finalize things and get them submitted. And that's what the public hearings are for. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to say if you're finalizing things, you're misrepresenting the situation, right? Um, in in your opinion, in your well, opinion, anybody doing the math, right? It's like if you're reducing the requirement to 10% or less, you're not going to get over 10% SHI and anybody's math, no matter what developer there is. I, I think as Elizabeth was saying, I think the opportunity for the demonstration of that would be at the public hearing for this. Right. And I'd be happy to attend and 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 speak my you know point of view. But I guess what I'm trying to say is you are finalizing something that you're sending out in a warrant, which I explained before. Not everybody goes to the public hearing. People read the warrant, right? And if they think it's something that they want to vote on one way or another they're gonna to go to town meeting. But if the warrant is misrepresenting the situation, saying, hey, we're gonna get more affordable housing when we do this, we're not. We're not gonna get more than 10% or 20% that we have now, you're gonna get less. And you're misrepresenting the situation. We're gonna get more housing, absolutely more housing, but I, not- I think, I think that goes back housing. to the point that at this point, that that's your opinion on that. And I appreciate you sharing it. Um, but it's not necessarily a, a truth that has panned out yet. <laughs> so no, well, again, we can, I, this is a, a good opportunity to have that debate at the at the public hearing for this. And I, I'm certain you will be there for it. Uh, and we look forward to that. But I do want to move on. We have another uh, 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 person looking to do uh, public comment. So Don, I see you there. Please uh, introduce yourself, um, uh, name and uh, uh, address. Sure, I'm Don Kupka from 39 Devons Street in Concord. And um, and I also wanted to comment on that same point because the it's a simple matter of mathematics that when you increase the denominator of a fraction, you reduce the fraction. And I thought it was a misrepresentation. Uh, and if anyone can show me it by mathematics, how increasing the denominator improves, uh, raises the fraction, uh, I'd love to see it. 
But if we build 10 more units of housing without any more affordable housing, we've reduced, we've, we've worsened our problem. It, it, that's all. And so I just would prefer if we are, are clear in the, uh, well, I think to Carol's point that we don't misrepresent. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Don. Well, the article does says improve or maintain. I personally consider it more likely that we would maintain than improve, but um, I can be hopeful. How, how could it be maintaining it if we're increasing the denominator without increasing the numerator? Because we would increase the numerator based on um, monies deposited in the Affordable Housing Trust, which would eventually be used. And it would not be improving instantaneously. There would be some form of lag since the monies must be collected and spent later. But once things, the lag should have eventually, once things start moving, turn constant rather than increasing. So I've, I've, I've checked with some folks on, on that to say, could we actually maintain with, with that payment? And the answer was absolutely not. We need units now. We don't need to be reducing this ratio. That's, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Pamela, I see you want, if you can, uh, just in the interest quick, of brevity. Quick question. Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green. Um, how did the 50,000, the, the percentage of contribution in lieu of building an affordable unit amount get set? Because it seems to me that a solution for this would be to increase that to the point where it was at least half as significant as the cost of building such a unit would have been. Can can so we... there has there has been no there has been no amount set. It, it's it's based on the project. It's based on the market rate units. It's based on exactly. how many units. It's um, there there is no there is no amount. There is there is a formula for determining the amount, and you can plug in any kind of numbers into that formula and get a general idea of what the result would be. Cor and correct. It, I, right I could now, not... Like I could not tell you low. what those numbers would be based on a project. Um, the finances for a development project of eight units is different than a development project of 175 units. Yes, but if they're doing eight units, they would already have an affordable unit in there. We're talking about um, one to four units, is it? One to five units? Um, so it, if what if it was four units and they were all studios? That would have a different different calculation than four units and they were all three bedrooms. Yes, but it would be the same formula. It's based on the formula that's in the bylaw here. And according to what kinds of theoretical examples we could put in there, the amount of money generated would not be enough to have the town like significantly uh, raise the the money that we could use to buy down units or to extend their their time. I think we should reconsider the amount of money that I, I'm in very much in favor of this plan. I really do think that kind of burden should be off small, projects, but I think that the amount of money that it should raise for the affordable housing trust in order for the town to create more units should be higher and is not going to be a burden on the developers if we do that. Um, so that the fractional comment was put um, for the board's um, for the board's knowledge because again I'm 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 not going to try and debate this tonight was put forth from um, the housing groups. So I can ask them to, um, cause it's based on average market sales price. Um, so maybe they're able to give a current example but that's something I would have to ask them. Thank you, Pamela. I do see, I, before you unmute yourselves, I do see Don and Carol, you, you've raised your hands again. I, we have talked about this at some length, and I know we will have another opportunity to discuss this. Um, so I do want to go ahead and move 
move forward uh, at this point. May I follow up on a question I asked at a previous meeting, which was what percentage of housing in Concord in the last few years has been built under projects that would fall under this? So I could get some sense of the magnitude of the issue. Thank you. In in the past couple of years, um, none. the The last project that was built was the two, I believe, the two units over Concord Outfitters. Okay. With that, we have we can move on to. Planning board meeting minutes for uh, September 27th, um, 2022. Were there any edits or um, issues with, oh, did I miss Sue, something? Yeah, so, no, um, uh, Sue just sent, um, uh, hang on one second. Um, just two other, uh, um, three other minor additional edits. Um, I can't see what this one is, but it looks maybe like a space. It, yeah, it, that was, it's I deleted it. Oh, there's a space after the word trust. Um, Getting adding, that. adding yeah. the word to, and that's it. Thank you, Sue, for reviewing that. Any other uh, board member? Space after trust oh. is still there. Oops, did I type it wrong? Um, I thought it was gone. It no, like it it's. Moved. It's, I, I have oh, not accepted that was a red it. line. Yep, yeah. yep. Okay, that's because um, uh, it's small and my eyes are bad. <laughs> if there are no uh, other questions or comments to that, I'll take a, a motion to accept those. I make uh, a motion that we, I make a motion that we approve the board meetings of September 27th as submitted. As amended. As amended, yeah. And, Thank you. Second. I heard Linda first, so Linda gets the second on that one. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Mark. Uh, okay, voting on accepting that, uh, Mark. Yes. Linda. Yes. Sue. Yes. And Andrew. Yes. And I'm also a yes. All right, any uh, liaison reports or town planner? Um, um, so, um, what the board will be seeing at your meeting, um, I don't know if it's going to be January 3rd, it, um, it, it might be January 3rd, because the 24th is getting kind of late. Um, by January 31st, um, the town has to submit their action plan for um, how they are going to move forward with compliance under the MBTA community's requirement. Um, and so it, it's a fairly, it's a fairly simple form, um, except at the end, putting in um, estimated dates on how the, you know, um, how the town will move forward to look at um, doing compliance. Um, so it's um, items such as um, doing you know, public engagement, and hopefully we can get a grant from the um, Massachusetts Housing Partnership. They'll help with um, that whole public engagement process. Um, then looking at um, actual districts, looking and then beginning to develop zoning. There's the whole um, GIS compliance modeling that's required. So our um, town's GIS analyst has started um, you know, there's 27 pages in the compliance modeling documents, so she's kind of going through those and, and uh, beginning to pull together that project. So that is um, that action plan um, will be, you know, the board should be it and then it will go to the select board before it gets submitted by um, the 31st. And then, you know, it just starts the you know, the community conversation on the MBTA community's requirement and um, and the, you know, the actual deadline for submitting 
should the town um, submit, you know, develop zoning and submit zoning is required to be submitted to DHCD before December of uh, December of 2024. All right, thank you for that. And there are no is uh, there are any liaison reports from anyone? Well, I could report that the West Concord Advisory Committee seems to have found a nice new volunteer, but we've already <laughs> gone through that. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, if there are none of the, uh, no other uh, liaison reports, uh, take a second for our general public comments. So, Carol, feel free to unmute yourself and reintroduce yourself. Sure, Carol Savoy, 61 Belknap Street. Um, I had a question on the MBTA Act. Um, the MBTA guidelines that came out said that Concord needs to build a thousand units within a half a mile of the train station to be compliant. Actually, I think it was a little over a thousand. So is that what you're looking to do as part of moving forward with this is to, um, you know, uh, tell the state how we're going to build a thousand units within a half a mile of uh, the train stations. Um, so I'll clarify the MBTA communities requirement does not require communities to build anything. Um, and it specifically states that in the guidelines. So it's requiring communities established zoning at a minimum of 15 units per acre. And then it requires you to communities to have, um, I can't think of the word. Um, there's two metrics. There's the, the zoning of at least 15 units per acre, but then you have to, um, go through this compliance modeling, which is the GIS analysis um, to show um, whether it's feasible to build. And I, and it's, yeah, it's a little, it's a little over um, a thousand units in a particular area. And that's right. the, that's the whole GIS modeling side of things. Right. But don't we have sewer infrastructure problems that we can't do it? Wetlands and all those other things. Yeah, that yeah. so that's that's specifically stated in the um, the Department of Housing and Community Development guidelines. There's a specific sentence that is in there that says, um, you know, they you communities right. are going to develop this this zoning, but doesn't you know they realize that it doesn't mean that you know things will get built. There's other there's other factors that go into actual development. Um, and that's the whole point. Zoning may be a tool, but there may be infrastructure, there may be um, roadway, there may be drainage, there may be site constraints, there may be topography, there may be wetlands. There's, you know, there's a lot of things that go into whether an actual project can be built. Um, and that's not part of zoning. And that's recognized in the guidelines. Right. So you're going to change the zoning. I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> um, so whether the select board, the planning board, and other boards and committees and the community through public engagement, which is wishes to move forward. Um, but for the town to remain in interim compliance, you you submit your, your action plan. Right. And, and it, it is the intention of the select board to submit that action plan. Ah, okay. A lot of towns are opting out and just saying, no, I don't know if you've read a lot of those articles because. Yes. And it now, seems um, there's quite a few housing authorities that are already starting to lose funding. So I, it, there's, there will continue to be a conversation about the MBTA communities requirement and DHCD guidelines, I think, um, at a at a high a much higher legislative and state level. Yeah. Right. We don't get any funding from those sources, do we? Concord? Um every every housing authority gets funding from the um the legis the appropriation of, of the legislature as far as the local capitals project. Um 
I don't know. I don't know what that is. I don't know if somebody at the housing authority knows how much that is, but right. Not but every every housing authority does get a piece of that pie. Got it. Okay. So the plan is that you're going to, or the select board, who who's bringing it forward? The the planning board, the zone, the select board. The, the select board the select is required board. to submit the action plan. But they have asked for the planning board's input. Got it. So if you were to change the zoning to comply, when would you start working on that? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure as as soon as possible. Okay, and that zoning would comply. Would say you could put a, a, a thousand units within half a mile of each train state. Uh, to, uh, of, of a train station um well, the 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 compliance model under the gis would have to somehow analyze that as i said i i yeah. not i don't know what goes into all of that yet um but right well that's the requirement from the state and the mbta communities act that's what they put out they gave concord they listed it they said a thousand yeah. units yeah. or more so we have to come up with that within a half a mile of a train station or the two train station combined. So that's a thousand units, you know, it's a um, lot of well, housing. It, it, once again, um, it specifically recognizes that communities probably, you built. won't, that won't be built. Yeah. It's not, it's not physically possible for that many units to be built in either, around either train station, whether you zone for it or not. Right. But even if you zone for it, and you get half of that. That's still 500 units. That's a lot of housing in Concord. Big increase, you know, big increase on the school system, big increase on the infrastructure, big increase on traffic, big increase across the board. It's significant. And, and I imagine if somebody goes through the development process, there would be a lot of input during the public hearings. I'm sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Not seeing any other hands for public comments. I will take this opportunity to close the uh, the meeting of December 13th, 2022 at 8.52 PM. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. And we'll Have see- Have a wonderful you. holiday, everybody. Yeah. Have Merry Christmas. Happy solstice. Bye.